Now, we're going to dig into this a little bit deeper, this subject, and I, uh, and I guess frame it in even more so around the Dutch market and its, in its sort of move towards um, regulated and legalised sports betting. Um, got a brilliant panel here, here with us today. Declan, you know already. We've got Eric Koenigs here, who's from uh, ESSA, who have just recently rebranded, I, I saw. Yeah. Yeah, we rebranded just two days ago, but that was before the, or that was after the uh, the program went into print. So, and the new name is, is uh, no more. It's now the in, uh, International Betting Integrity Association. Excellent. And we have Peter Rovers, who's from Rovers FC, formerly commercial director of, of PSV. Correct. And we have Jack Kennedy from Sport Radar. How did you do, Tom? Okay. Nice. Uh, thanks very much for for joining us today. Okay. So, um, I think it's probably important just to put all of that stuff into the context of where the Dutch market is right now. And given that we are a matter of months away from online sports betting being legalized, what, is, what are the stuff you were talking about then mean for a market that's about to regulate? Does it make it easier to put these, these solutions in place? Is, are we running out of time to put them in place before it, before it happens? What, 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 what needs to be done now and in the next couple of years to, to address the issues and the challenges that you presented yet? Yeah, look, I, I would argue that it's better to put your defenses in place before the attack comes. And in no way am I trying to insinuate that there's a, a rampant corruption problem in Dutch sport now. But I'm saying, look, get the issues in now, and particularly as you go through a media campaign over the next few months, make sure that you're addressing those issues now so that you don't surrendering that moral high ground to your opponents. So get it in now, get that discussion going now. For some people in the room and for, and for the general public, the idea that sports betting, you know, this is a big argument in the, in the States as well that, that was had, um, and indeed by some of the leagues. Permissive regulation around sports betting could increase the chance of corruption. That is a, a, a belief that's held in, in, by, by many people. Can you put the you know, people at ease here, Jack, maybe you can, you can start on this, that that is the case and, and, and uh, oh, sorry, brother, isn't the case and why, that, why that's a fact? Yeah, something that Declan touched on, um, touched on earlier there is that there's this misconception that um, match fixing happens with person A and person B getting together, you know, players on a football team and conspiring, but the big problem comes from these illegal betting markets and uh, Declan actually said exactly that there. Basically, the, for these criminal gangs to profit, they need to have the turnover levels and the betting limits that the Asian market offers. Um, and if you, if you regulate a national market, as Declan said again, you kind of see this trickle down effect. So the Asian markets, we can rule out getting kind of information on uh, who's behind any suspicious bets and things like this, which may point the finger at who's responsible for manipulating these games. But if we have um, the regulated market um, where betting operators can work with the sporting federations, that's when we'll begin to see um, this kind of account level information from uh, legal betting operators, which will help authorities point the finger at who's behind um, these kind of manipulating schemes. You know, we can start from the players in that case and, and work our way up and identify the criminal gangs. So it's better that it's being done in the spotlight rather than... Absolutely, yeah. Um, uh, if I can add to that, I mean, as, as Jack said, it's a bit of a misconception that, that regulating locally increases the risk of match fixing. There's a global market liquidity pool and that, that liquidity is not affected by whether Netherlands or Belgium or Sweden is regulated, yes or no. So in terms of the risk on match fixing, no, it does not increase the risk on match fixing. What it does increase is the opportunity to cooperate for uh, people to disclose information to a national platform, to cooperate uh, within that national platform between all the relevant stakeholders, being the prosecutor, the police forces, the betting operators, and the world of sports. So uh, in our view, um, regulation, local regulation, is a step forward in the fight against match fixing and not a step back. Yeah, I think the theme of this afternoon, really, in general, is about the relationship between sports and betting becoming closer, Sometimes we're good, sometimes we're bad, but ultimately the collaboration needs to be there to benefit everybody. And this is a, this is a key moment in the market where domestic sports, and we'll come on to, to Peter's view now, um, have to engage with the betting industry in one, one way or another. Leagues and clubs are going to be, you know, there's lots of sponsorship opportunities. Sure. Uh, you know, there's, there's broadcast rights, data rights, there's all sorts of things that, that are going to happen over the next few years. Um, how do you see the relationship between sports and betting 
evolving or has evolved over the last few years? I think that there's still a lot of work to do for the Dutch, for the Dutch sports organizations. Um, if I listen to the topic of today, then um, well, I'm pretty much concerned. I mean, I know that there are some uh, corporations now between uh, the Dutch Olympic Committee, the Dutch FA and the Dutch Professional Football League in order to team up and address uh, these kind of topics, including the regulations um, in, um, in the talks with, um, with the people in The, in the Hague. Uh, but on a club level or on a federation level, they are still far, far behind. And um, I, I still, still learn to say that they're ignorant yet, but um, everybody is focusing on the commercial potential on that level and leaves the difficult topics um, to other, to, to other people to address. So that is, I think, if I, if I listen to what's happening now in the world, and, and the, um, well, uh, Declan definitely opened my eyes. I mean, I knew that there was, there was a lot going on, but that it was this worse uh, was, was, was a, not what a surprise, but it was... Um, Quite scary. Well, yeah. And uh, so th that means that um, there's really a lot of work to do for the, for the, for the Dutch sports organizations in this perspective. Yeah. Do, do you agree with that, Declan? That the, 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 do you find that when you're talking to sports that they're, they're at all levels, and maybe, maybe it differs from, from, from the top tiers down to the, to the lower tiers, that they are engaging in the right way, that they are putting the right practices and, and policies in place to, to address this, or are some burying their head in the sand? Um, let me start by, uh, with the disclaimer that there are many good people in sports industry because what I'm about to say is going to um, sound pretty savage. So, I, and, and I don't have time to parse through all the good people and things. But self-regulation doesn't work in sausage factories. You don't have the, the owner of the sausage factory saying, you know, we're going to reveal to the public when we have toxic product. It doesn't work. There's a reason why every sport in the world has a referee and an umpire. Self-regulation, this kind of thing, doesn't work. And it's, it, it's, it, it's incumbent on sports, uh, excuse me, most sports leagues, most sports officials, with some honorable exceptions, don't want outside voices and they don't want an outside perspective into possible corruption. And that's one of the biggest issues that we have in fighting corruption. Did you agree with that, Jack? You, you must have to have that conversation. Yeah, I mean, there's a couple of, con con sort of conflicting views. Is that, um, I mean, you'll know as well that a lot of uh, major federations engage with like third party monitoring systems. And so they're, they're kept abreast of the problem and they're kept abreast of whether there's any issues. And I agree with Declan that there's, there's absolutely no, there's no real positives in going public straight away and saying, oh, you know, well, we've had this problem in one of our games because that damages the reputation. Um, of everything associated with the game, and it, you know, it damages people's enjoyment. Um, but I do, I do think that most federations are are pretty engaged in the topic. They're aware it's a risk, um, and I think overall, there's kind of a, a good awareness um, of what they need to be doing to, to minimise the risk, because yeah. um, they're aware it exists. Yeah, and perhaps it's, it's a good opportunity to, without going into too much detail, talk about the process, and, and, and Eric, you can probably chip in on this as well, the process of, of what sports need to do um, from an educational sense around their players and officials to if they do find some suspicious activity, what, what's the kind of step-by-step, -step, maybe you can sort of do a bit of a tag team here, but what's the kind of step-by-step -step process that, that sports need to, you know, whether it's a, a club or a league, need to go through to, to stamp this stuff out? So from an educational point of view, the onus is on, definitely on sports rather than, um, than kind of sports betting companies and, and uh, that industry. The onus should be on sports. Uh, you know, as Declan's um, shown in his video there, um, these sportsmen, you know, they don't often come from the most well-educated backgrounds, um, and they're not always aware when somebody is kind of manipulating them and grooming them for this kind of thing. So having a strong educational program uh, up front is, is absolutely essential, I would say. Um, I don't know if everyone else agrees. And then but perhaps what, and then, you know, if, if something does slip through the net and there's some suspicious, suspicious activity, the information sharing process, what, what, what's best practice there? Eric? Yeah, well, obviously, you know, in, in that national platform that I talked about, every individual stakeholder has its own responsibilities. And, of 
of course, I represent the industry, so I'll focus on, on the responsibility of the industry. It is our industry to be able to say who is betting on what. That's what it all starts with. We need to know who is coming into our shop, basically, and what he is betting on. And if then you see irregular activity or suspicious betting, uh, suspicious betting activity, apologies, uh, you need to report that as soon as possible to the relevant authorities, obviously. Then there's your, your MOUs with sports federations. You can disclose uh, some information to them as well. But an issue there is that uh, there is, a, of course, with the GDPR being put into, in, in, into place, there is an issue around the disclosure of personal data to non-public authorities. And, and um, that is something that, for instance, in the Netherlands, uh, that we see as a challenge. In the UK, there is a, a legal basis to disclose personal information to sports governing bodies based on, I think it's, it's um, Article 13, Part 6, Schedule, whatever, of the Gambling Act. That gives us legal basis to legally disclose personal data to sports governing bodies to say, hey, that match you organized yesterday or two days ago, we saw suspicious activity there. This is what we saw. In the Netherlands, we don't have that. Um, because we don't have it, we can't disclose it. Um, and because we, di we don't disclose it, we might be perceived as not willing to cooperate. But that's not the case, because it's in our best interest to cooperate. But then we say, well, give us the, give us the, uh, the tools we need to, to be able to make that uh, disclosure, uh, you see. And in the end, you know, that's, that's a little bit more philosophical, but in the end, World of Sports and the betting industry were part of the same entertainment chain. You know, you, ha you have media, you have sport clubs, you have the athletes, you have the betting operators. We all, in we all uh, work together to, 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 to yeah, how do we start? We all contribute to the sports entertainment chain. And, and in my view, in, in the various member states, often you find yourself opposed to each other, whereas I think you should work side by side because you're finding a common interest, which is to stamp out the guys that we saw in the video and make sure that people can enjoy sports, place a bet without too much fuss. Yeah, it, absolutely. It's a, there is no benefit to anybody in this, in this chain for this stuff happening. I think sometimes, again, maybe public perception is that, it's that bookmakers couldn't care less if something's fixed. It's, you know, it's, they probably think it's someone else's problem. It's not beneficial to, to anyone in this in the industry. No, and I'm, I'm, I mean I'm stating the obvious, but it is detrimental to your reputation. And of secondly, course. if the uh, unpredictability of a sport event is taken away, then the, the whole the whole reason why sports betting exists uh, is not there anymore. So, but yeah, I'm preaching to the choir in yeah. this beautiful church, by the way. But uh, yeah. yeah, Peter, that you know, from from your point of view as someone uh, on the commercial side of uh, a rights holder, what does yeah, th these conversations and what we saw in, in that video, what are the risks posed to the, the rights holders' business and, and revenue by, by this, by this uh, match-fixing threat? From a revenue point of view? Well, and from a reputational revenue point of view? I think it's all about what, what Eric just, just said about credibility. And uh, nobody wants to put its credibility on stake. So I think that clubs, uh, rights holders in general, will be ex have to be extremely careful um, regarding this topic. And... Um, on the one hand, uh, make sure that they protect and support and guide, educate players. And I think that also their agents play an important role in that, in that whole process. Because, I mean, the agents of those youngsters that earn millions uh, in football in any way, um, they also are responsible for their financial management. So, I mean, this could be part of their total, um, uh, let's say, educational program. And on the other side, um, I think clubs have a responsibility in terms of commercialization towards the general public to educate um, the uh, players on the, on, the, on the gambling side um, in, in, in terms of responsible gaming. And um, I think that, that in that perspective, too, uh, education plays, in a, uh, plays a very important role. And there are lots of good uh, examples abroad that could be um, used by the Dutch sports um, industry um, to, um, to anticipate on that, uh, on that process. How did you know what I was going to ask next? I, don't know. <laughs> um, <laughs> I was going to, about to ask Declan what we can learn from other markets. Uh, and, you know, what, what, what have we seen in more in mature um, gambling markets that have been, you know, again, protocols that have put, been put in place that have had a, a positive impact? And, and indeed, the, where mistakes have been made and that, that, that the Netherlands can learn from. A question for you, Declan. Yeah, I'm trying to uh, impress everybody in the room with some intellectual quote from Adam Smith. <laughs> and I'm sorry, guys, I'm failing you here. 
Um, but anyway, there's some quote by Smith in Wealth of Nations where he says, you get a bunch of people together in the same industry and they immediately start to figure out ways of collaborating as, as opposed to competing with each other. Com competition is good. And competition for integrity is really good. And I love when uh, Sport Radar has fistfights with Fetterbat or Bet Genius. I think it's great for all of us, you know, when these guys drop their gloves, throw at each other, and they come at each other. What really doesn't work is when we all get together and all agree what a wonderful world it is. We need competition. We need to say, what are you doing? You know, how can I can show the Nigerian goalkeeper throwing the ball into his net and nobody's being sanctioned for that? So we need independent checks and balances on ourselves. And I, I you know, I've never read anything that has accused the Dutch of not being ready for an argument. Like, they're just ready to go. So we need to set up in the Netherlands checks and balances where people are ready to say, look, you're not doing your job. We're supposed to be protecting us, and you're not doing it. Does there also need to be a, a law in place to, to prosecute? I think we need, a, look, we need an independent national agency. We have it for our meatpacking plants. We have independent inspectors going into a meat factory and saying, this guy's, this isn't good. We know it's in your factory's interest to downplay the state of your sausages, but we've got a problem, and we're going public with it. And that keeps them up to scratch. No, it's just going back to your, your earlier question about which markets um, they could learn from. Um, I just came from Portugal. And one of the points they had there was um, that the, there's been like a long land-based um, sports betting uh, infrastructure in place, but the kind of regulation and legalization of online gambling has just developed there in the last three years. And one issue that they had facing there is actually a pro prohibitively high tax rate on operators um, working in Portugal. And what that has actually meant is that a lot of kind of more reputable operators are offering services to Portuguese clients, but not licensed strictly through the Portuguese system. Um, so, and I had many discussions about this afterwards. I mean, that's probably something I would look to address then. Um, making sure that it is an, like an attractive market for these um, operators to kind of maintain above, you know, stay above board. Yeah, total transparency is a, is, a, is a huge tool. It's not, but if I may, it's not only about the transparency. I mean, we saw that, that picture of um, the continent of Europe. There's 28 member states. Four of them didn't have a police investigation into match fixing. Uh, Russia, Kazakhstan, the, forgot the third one. We're the fourth one. You know, so it's not only about transparency. It's also about priority. I mean, do we have the resources? Do the, the authorities have the resources and the desire um, to really uh, dig into this? Uh, secondly, uh, there is no provision in the law that makes match fixing in itself, uh, uh, how do you call it? Uh, uh, criminal. Criminal, uh, criminal. Yeah, yeah, thanks. I mean, we have fraud, of course, you have money laundering. There's no provision for match fixing. We might need that. Uh, third, as I said, you know, the legal basis for disclosure of personal data more freely. We need that. So that is stuff we can learn from, from other markets, from the good and the bad. Um, but but it, it all starts with the desire from the top to... Uh, to really, uh, how do you call it, like, uh, really pick up this problem and really, really prioritize it and, 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 and go, go and battle it, you know. Do you get the impression that that's happening here in the Netherlands at the moment, the conversations are happening to pull the right stakeholders together to set this up? Honest, uh, honest, uh, honest perception. As, as, as Mr. Hill said, you know, that uh, there is a national platform in sort of embryonic stage, and that's good. That is good. And, you know, the Remote Gaming Act has been adopted in the Senate. Good. Uh, but I'm, I just keep thinking, how is it possible that we didn't see a police investigation? We're not immune to match fixing. Let's not be naive here. The Netherlands is not... Uh, we've seen markets, uh, um, I should put it differently, countries with, where the market, uh, the betting market for the domestic football league is similar to ours in terms of commercial attractiveness, liquidity, volume, Belgium, Finland, uh, Czech Republic, Slovakia. They've seen investigations. We haven't seen them. Um, I'm not saying that, that, that they necessarily missed something, but it makes me just wondering, yeah, are we, like, how do you call it, like dedicated enough and, and, and um, yeah, to really see what the threat is. And, and, and because, you know, it's, it's, education is good. Hotline is good. National platform, uh, it's all good. But, but you're dealing with organized crime. We saw the guy, and, and that realization, I'm, I'm not sure if everybody always realizes that that is the face of match fixing. It is not that athlete that, that 
hits a double fault and, and that makes 50 or 100 bucks on the betting market with that, you know? Yeah. That's the threat we're facing. So. Well, hopefully so, yeah. the, the right people are in the room somewhere and they're gonna be forced into action after this session. It's true. Uh, what, Eric said, what Eric said, the, um, let's say, clubs and federations doesn't understand how serious the problems are at the moment. I mean, um, we're all pretty uh, close to the topic and still surprised by, um, by what Declan showed us today. So um, there is a lot of learnings to do for, um, for sports, uh, for rights holders in this country, yes. Yeah. Um, Declan, you're keen to get your thoughts on, away from um, independent bodies and information sharing, from a f pure product point of view, um, in Australia, for example, in-game betting, in-play betting is illegal online. Um, because, and the reason they state it, because it, um, in their opinion, increases the chances of, of match fixing. What do, you, what do you think about that? And, and, and what, you know, is restricting product in that sense a good thing and will help the fight against corruption? Or does it help, as, as, as Jack was saying, to have a broader, you know, open product set where, where, more, where more is above? So, sorry, to... to, to uh, be clear. The question is, should bookmakers be forced to not offer certain bets? Like in the Spanish match fixing case that I referred to, the, the fix was the halftime score plus the full time score plus the number of corners in the game. And that way they were going to make 27 or 28 times as much money as they would if they just fixed the game. Yeah. And so the question is, should they restrict those corners off Spanish betting? Or national yeah, things. it's happened in different. Like Australia is the kind of the, the, the black and white example in play, you know, But there's there's other markets that have sought to restrict yeah, and, the product and, for and the. My, res my response would be what I think most people in this room would be is like, ah, it's absolute fucking nonsense. I mean, sorry, sorry, I don't mean to swear, but thanks. But I mean, you know, all the the punter needs to do is go to another website. They can offer. They can get that thing. Is there a symbolic value? to taking off some of those exotic bets? Yes, absolutely. I think that's a legitimate question, so long as everybody realizes the true state of the market, that it's not really gonna make much of a difference. But for symbolism, yeah, why not do a few things? But that's really where we're at. For the purposes of channelization and, and, and into the, the regulated market, it's a bad idea. Uh, I'm not saying people... it's a bad idea, it's just a useless idea, yeah. you know, symbolically. And uh, by the way, I'm sorry for swearing. I know Mr. Rogers <laughs> was offended, so I'm very sorry, guys. No worries. I swear all day. <laughs> I think you can get away with it here. <laughs> Did you have anything to add, add to that? Well, Jeff? just a point that Declan um, made at the end there is about whether they understand the state of the market. And in all our experiences, I'm sure we'll say that most, most people who kind of are tasked with engaging on this problem don't understand the market at all. They don't ex understand where the true risk actually comes from. As Declan says that those markets, they're not, they're not the issue. If people are going to manipulate games, and if people know how to manipulate games, you know, they'll do exactly as he says, they'll go offshore. These people know how to make money. They're not making money from these kind of low-level derivative markets that are not substantial. And you know, they're easily detectable. Yeah, yeah. But you still hear politicians. Exactly that, yeah. Or politicians talk about it a lot. Just before I open up to the floor, I just want to ask a question for whoever wants to answer it. Does this end somewhere? Does it get eradicated or diminished to a point where it's less of a, you know, a, a worry for the industries, the sports and betting industries? What, what happens? Where does it go from here? Yeah, I, look, I've, I've seen in Asia there's a graveyard of sports. So uh, they have a bunch of sports which are kind of limping along. But, they, you know, their sponsorship, their fan attendance, their TV rights, are, you know, they're, in the, they're really in the rubbish bin. And I think what, what, what the danger of this particular issue is it's coming at the same time that FIFA and UEFA are clearly interested in untethering the balloon. And so the balloon is teams like Arsenal, Manchester United, Real Madrid, Ajax, PSV, who people follow. And the idea is that you untether those, those guys float off into their own lovely pan-European league, and they leave Groningen and uh, Twente and the other national leagues down here. And those national leagues are in some ways disappearing. And that's the challenge and that's the real problem is that corruption will hit those national levels. So it's in 10, 20 years I see people being focused on a globalized sport and not paying attention to local sport. Creating a blind spot. Eric? 
I think, you know, people trying to fool each other is, is as old as, or as long as there have been people around, people have been trying to fool each other. So, uh, let's say the, the, the human trait of, you know, trying to, 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 to manipulate or fraud or whatever, it's, it's, not, gonna, it's not gonna go away. Uh, what you can do by having the right setup locally is, is, is push it away from your market and, and hopefully away from the continent. Um, but you're never going to change the human, uh, the human tendency to, uh, to cheat and manipulate. Anything to add, Peter? Yeah, <clears throat> I think that um, clubs have to do, rights holders in general have to do whatever they can to participate with the with the legislator and with the industry and, and with everybody uh, fighting this, um, this problem because, I mean, they can't afford to be involved. If you look at um, the clubs like the, the clubs that Declan just mentioned, they're investing millions or tens of millions in brand image, brand equity. Um, and if you look at the financial impact of betting in their overall budgets, if you look at in, in Holland, it will be for a club like Ajax, it will be one, one and a half million on a total budget of 150 million. So it's 1% of their income. They won't risk 100% uh, of their brand equity. So um, I think that rights holders in general will, will act very carefully uh, from that perspective. Jack, I mean, I guess the, the evolution of technology might play a role in, in, in this as well. I mean, I mean, absolutely. I think we're looking at the evolution of sports betting in the past 20 years and it's become it's a byproduct of the internet, in effect, this kind of online betting habit. As um, the speed of internet has evolved, the speed of data tra you know, transfers evolved, um, which gives people you know, the power to, power to place bets at the push of a button. Um, in terms of the future, I mean, who truly knows? In terms of more g general future and the outlook of sports betting, um, I was reading a good article I was saying to David earlier about um, betting in America and about how it's kind of got a a merge of the two systems. It's got the Asian system of um, high turnovers, uh, um, encouraging people to bet, you know, multiple times on the same value, and the value of information that these people are providing. You know, aggressive customer profiling and allowing bookmakers to be um, be a bit more accurate in their um, in their systems, um, and and the kind of the merge of the European as well, where people um, who are placing bets at these regulated outlets are required to provide some level of um, personal information. That's going to help. I believe so, yeah. I hope so. Okay, fantastic. Th uh, thank you very much. Any questions from the audience on this topic? I think, yes. There's a couple here. Yes, my name is uh, Dolph Stegaar. I'm a sports lawyer at CMS. I have a question to you, Mr. Hill. You mentioned it briefly already about the pan-European competition in football. Um, but you might be aware as well that uh, the Dutch uh, team, some of the Dutch teams are discussing with Belgium teams about the uh, Bene Liga, the Dutch-Belgian uh, competition. Um, in your opinion, is it bringing in uh, the Netherlands the uh, Trojan horse, or what is your experience on that? Yeah, I read that article as well with interest, and I, 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 have, to, I have to say, I thought that was a good one, because um, as you know better than I do, there's a long, shared culture and history in, uh, between Belgium and Netherlands for all kinds of stuff going back 500 years. So I thought that kind of league is, um, is good so long as you've got relegation and promotion, so long as a team like Leers can go up and fight against Ajax at some point or Twente or Groningen or one of these teams. It, it didn't seem to me that they were cutting the ties completely. What, what I fear of when the, the proposals I've seen from FIFA and UEFA is that they have no interest in relegation or promotion. These are gonna be the 25 top teams in Europe and they have no interest in playing, you know, Hertha Berlin or Warsaw or these other things. They can go to things. And so I think that's the danger, that's really dangerous. And I haven't frankly seen much discussion uh, of the dangers of that Super League. There's one more. Rolf Goudsmith, Easy Playtime. Uh, I got a question for any one of you. Uh, what's the situation in esports? Because I, we talked about sports, but when we talk our business, esports, where it's going, what's the problem there and the risk? 
Um, I, I, I just passed over esports just because I, I forgot to mention them, but they've had fundamentally the same, many of the same issues as regular sports. So match fixing in esport, if you punch it into Google the next time you're on a search thing, you'll see a plethora of cases. And for many of the same reasons, exploitation of players, um, players are, are really working far too hard, 12, 13, 14 hours a day. They're not being rewarded properly. There was an overarching structure. That's slowly changing, I think. Esports is maturing a bit better, but there have been many cases of match fixing in esports. Anyone else want to add to, no, to that? No, not much. I, I think I have to check, but I'm pretty sure that it's not, it's not within the scope of regulation in the Netherlands going forward. Uh, and I think the world of esports, it needs to take a few leaps in, in terms of professionalism before you can uh, approach it as, or, or before it's perceived as a mature betting market such as football or, or basketball or handball. Um, yeah. Okay. Any more questions from the floor? Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you for our panel and for Declan's presentation. Brilliant. Thank you. Thanks, Eric.